Okay. Okay, at least we have one guest, Ajahn, Ajahn Alice, uh, yeah, joining us here. Um, <laughs> okay, then um, uh, yeah, welcome everyone to the Slamo Exchange Talk. I'm Henry Tan, and together with Laurie Ramsells, um, today we're gonna we will talk about how how we come up together with these projects. Um, Oh, there are people joining us sorry yeah and and um this project we we got the kind kindly supported from british councils connecting to through culture grant and um the f the goal of this project actually is to 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 initiate the um face-to-face -face contact but um, we have met um, in february 2020 why um Laurie has to visit Thailand and then um, I supposed to visit Birmingham in, in May 2020 but um, it's postponed until until further notice <laughs> yeah and then yeah sadly uh, <laughs> things aren't so great in the UK so it's probably for the best <laughs> you're not coming um, over at the moment but we hope in future you'll we'll be able to come over um, for another time yes uh, yeah okay maybe we I mean uh, we will make we try to make it um, quite relaxed and casual. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Let's next slide. So today, um, yeah, we will talk about our practice and then how we come up with the ideas of the slime exchange and what is slime mo? Why we are coming to interest in in slime mo so much. And yeah, later we will kind of open for Q and A for everyone. Okay, Laurie. Yeah, thank you, Henry. So um, yeah, as you said, I'll talk a little bit about my practice, um, and then Henry will have an opportunity to talk about um, his, and then we'll talk more about some of the things that we've found that overlaps between our practices and um, projects that we might want to work on together going forward, and have already started looking at. Um, so a little bit about my background, um, so I am uh, an artist working in Birmingham and I work with um, living materials, um, so I've worked in the past with um, bacterial cellulose which is a um, sort of hard material that's given off by certain bacteria um, that you can turn into um, various different um, sort of other kinds of materials like you can tan it so it becomes like leather or you can bleach it so it turns into a sort of paper like material um, and also working with um, slime mold a little bit um, um, beforehand as well um, so I'm interested in organic materials but I'm also interested in 3D printing and so these are a couple of um, images of some works that um, where I was using 3D printing um, with plaster on the left um, but taking digital scans of my body um, and then amalgamating them together and on the right there's a more handheld sort of 3D printing um, process uh, that I use with a 3D printing pen um, and then also um, trying to look at how 3D printing can extend into those kind of organic materials this was a 3D printer that I made that can print clay um, and on the left there you can see some tentacles that I made in preparation for going to visit Henry um, over in Bangkok, Bangkok at Tentacles Gallery, which he's got there, which I gifted him some. Um, and in the middle also, uh, sort of, so interested in biological forms, in biological materials, uh, and looking Oops, at future technologies. Oops, sorry. Right. It kind of stuck. Okay, then it's, it's my next, next one. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, I mean, I'm an artist based in Bangkok, and then I'm interested in... Um, neuroscience um, consciousness and sleeps and dreams um, I'm trying to explore with new technologies and then this this projects we we are discussing about um, uh, the, the 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 eel populations crisis in Japan and also reflecting back to the, the, the human populations okay maybe I just Oh. oh um i'm yeah i'm trying to to understand how how our brain wave works um, 
and then also it relate in related to the consciousness and then how we how we i mean how how should i say it um how it's how, what does it mean it, what does our dreams mean um how how can we translate it and what does consciousness mean um i mean there are many questions that is coming up through to different projects that i'm coming kind of working and then this this project I'm trying to create um a 3d models from from the brain wave yeah and then um yes and then this we try to print it out and of course uh, so i'm also an interested in digital fabrications and also bio fabrication as well mm. so when we met up um, or when we were initially talking about ideas um, that we could go forward with in terms of this collaboration um, with British Council, um, we were aware that we were both interested in these kind of organic networks <clears throat> and actually we looked at different ways of creating um, already within sort of um, experiments or projects different kinds of um, networks that were based on 3D printing or looking at um, dreams or synapses um, and then some of the other work that I've been looking at in terms of like mushrooms and uh, funguses and motor proteins and, and also working with slime mold a little bit. Um, and so these were some things that we kind of talked about or explored as different kind of different ways that we could um, start looking at collaborative projects. I mean, these, these are and some... we'll talk about them yeah. a little bit more in depth um, as we go along, I should say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this is the, the kind of... Um, projects that done by um, some scientists in Japan who are trying to experiment with slime mold then the, the, the fantastic thing is that slime mold can can find the shortest route um, to find food and then um, this even though it's like just a single cell organisms and then also this one is an experiment where they try to control the robot with the, um, the, the signal that came from slime molds so this is so this is how how we find it very fascinating. Okay, next slide. This is the life cycle of the slime molds, and then um, of course we always see this um, the green blob that, that um, kind of crawling, and then this is the the um, plasmodium um, state. Yes, and then but actually it's um it has many has many many state of its its life cycles. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, in that previous um, image where you see like a, another life cycle of a of a different species of slime mold, it, it's about how, as Henry said, you have this single cellular organism that kind of streams together into these clumps which is what you see visibly as like the yellow or brown or different colored sort of um, globules that um, you can see in the video that are kind of moving around. I should say that's been sped up quite a bit. Um, it doesn't move that fast in reality. Um, so as I was saying with organic networks one of the things that I had sort of been looking at as um, out of interest which had sort of come up in different areas of research that I found incredibly interesting was um, how mushrooms and mycelium um, work and share resources. Um, so on the left, on the big picture, you've got a ring of mushrooms. It's called a fairy ring. They're quite not common exactly, but you find them, um, especially in, in the UK, you can find them in fields. And um, on the on the right, at the top, you've got a species of mushroom called honey. It's just called a honey. It's called honey mushroom um, in America, which is actually the world's biggest organism um, apparently so at the bottom there you can see three and a half square miles that's actually how large this mushroom is but it's not that the mushroom itself is that big it's that the mycelium network which is the sort of middle image those white filaments they extend up to three and a half square miles out in different directions and what's interesting about the fairy ring is that when um, it finds sort of a, a rich area of nutrients or, or food that it's where it's going to sort of grow around. Rather than growing directly on top of that source, like you'd assume it would, it actually grows a ring around it, and it shares those resources out to the to the edges. So 
when you think about that with regards to things like urban planning or cities, it's quite an interesting analogy to draw or look at in terms of um, biomimicry of how you could decentralize the wealth or um, resources that like um, a capital city has um, or that a high street has and how you can share those resources out to the peripheral kind of wards or different parts of the country um, so that there's a more equitable sharing of that, of that economic wealth or, or resource. Um, so that was just one um, thing that we're sort of interested in and we talked about looking at. Um, so Slime World works in a sort of similar way to that kind of mycelium network, but um, a little bit not exactly sharing it out into a kind of peripheral kind of way, but it's more how it builds networks between different points um, that allows you to share resources and, and nutrients in the most materially efficient way. So as Henry said, it, it can be used, scientists have used it in maps to find um, routes around um, mazes, um, and it, it, it finds the, 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 the route around because it's, it creates connections and strengthens connections um, around pathways between the oats in that in that point and oats are like a sort of staple diet of the slime mold so this this work here was a piece that i did for um birmingham art map um so transparently underneath this this petri dish plate uh you can you can't see it exactly here but um there is a um, a map um which has got red nodes on it numbered nodes and those are um, places that are organizations, art galleries and organizations that are participating in the art map that, that, that month. Um, and I put oats on top of each one of those um, positions and then I've introduced the slime mold and seen how it forms out of an initial web of connections that it throws out, how it finds the most, um, the, the quickest sort of route or the, the most straightforward route and it reinforces that um, with with sending more cells um, and then you start to build up a picture of the most efficient way of going around that map and how you can um, look at the city infrastructure and see how you can um, follow that route um, so that you can go and see the most exhibitions on the on the Birmingham art map happening that month um, in the most efficient sort of way. Oh, wait, 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 sorry. So that was a sort of first, that was an initial sort of dabbling in, in slime mold. And then um, back in 2018, um, when um, myself and Henry actually took part in a um, bio, um, camp. bio camp um, in Tokyo, um, which was a sort of conference, 10 day sort of conference of, of bio artists from all over the world meeting and, and sharing ideas and, and looking at making um, work together. Um, I actually carried on using some slime mold that they had um, in their labs to explore some of the cherry blossoms, like the, 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 the way the cherry blossoms had sort of bloomed out. Uh, so we created a sort of fake cherry blossom stem um, out of agar in the plates. And we introduced, um, we, took, we dyed the oats like petals um, and put them into the plate to see how the um, slime mold moved around in these different sort of environments and also observing how it might interact differently with, um, instead of using just an even bed of agar on the, on the plate, how it might change its um, behaviour if, if it's coming into contact with different kinds of agar or, or colourings or things like that. Um, and as I say, Henry will show you, oh sorry, um, and so on this other slide, <clears throat> one of the last things that we tried to do as well, you can see that when it was being exhibited, there's some blue lights that are in the bottom of the plate. Um, so another thing that we were interested in testing was whether light would have any different um, effect on how that slime mold uh, moved. Would it sort of be drawn to the light or would it move away from the light or wouldn't, wouldn't it care in the slightest about the light? Um, and if not blue light, then could you try different coloured lights or so on and so forth? And then um, I think Henry's going to show you some of the work that he was. Certainly, we weren't working together. Um, we were sort of working um, in different in project, projects yeah. at the time. But yeah, Henry can share a bit about his projects that he's working on. Um, and I mean, this this our, our groups. I mean, I'm not the same group with 
Lowry at that time, and then we we tried to create um, a temples where where we used the radioactive um, stones like a, it's called thoriums to to cultures like microorganisms, and then it's kind of it's kind of inspired from the the Godzilla stories that we we all agree that we use it as an in inspirations for these projects so we try to create these temples and then also there are many temples that that um in asian cultures that temples that people would go pray for um uh, to, to have kids if, if you want to have um, offsprings then there are several temples or there, that that people can go pray for and then we, we we were thinking that can we use this um radioactive uh, um to grow Kind of microorganisms that it can become um, like a, a, like a Godzilla nurseries. Yeah, this that that our ten days projects. Um, so um, as I said, this that was the sort of point at which um, Henry and myself met and had sort of initially kind of talked about ideas that we were interested in, and, and as he said, we worked sort of independently in groups. But over time, we sort of stayed in touch and, and developed. Um, ideas for this collaborative um, project together um, and one of the things at the time that I was exploring back in 2020 uh, I mean say back in 2020 it was only like a few months ago but <laughs> <laughs> um, was um, with regards to the um, ongoing coronavirus pandemic which um, didn't interrupt my ability to go over to, to visit Henry um, but it's unfortunately played a big role in Henry not being able to come over to the UK um, to um, uh, also have that kind of connection and, and cultural sort of um, experience of, of being here. Mm -hmm. um, was in regards to the um, effect that the pandemic might have on, on bio arts practices like ours, and especially at the time when we were writing sort of applications or looking at um, things to apply for or, or, or do, I was very aware that working with biological material might not be the most um, favourable thing for a lot of people at the moment, given the obvious um, grief and, and um, loss that was being sort of experienced worldwide, and and and, it, and the and the um, the virus being a, a very um, delicate sort of conversation to start talking around working with living. Um, uh, creatures, uh, organisms, uh, even though viruses technically aren't um, living. Um, but Henry, if you don't mind just getting back for oh, one second. Um, this image was, was um, included from the um, slime mold Birmingham art map that I created. And, and what sort of kick-started the whole talk was the fact that this that piece of artwork had been um, asked to be used um, by a couple of um, organisations here in the UK for, or to promote their residency programmes or to promote um, sort of projects or, 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 or talks that were happening. And suddenly I was getting people saying that they didn't want to use this imagery anymore um, because of, again, because of the, the pandemic and, and in the, the emails it would say, you know, that it's a bit sort of too close to, to the bone or it's going to, you know, cause some, some upset. And of course I understood that, but I also, as I say, um, the 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 work the slime mold that's being used here has got nothing to do with the the, the corona virus or viral i mean it's a, an entirely different mm. um organism um so it was interesting to think about whether after pandemic post pandemic um bio arts or working with materials mm. um would be something that would be seen as um important to kind of know more about or if actually people wouldn't want to know anything about it because of the obvious kind of destruction it had um, caused. And so it was this partly uh, feeling that I think it was important that we actually talk about living materials in artwork because there's a lot to learn um, and, and understand from it um, that I did this talk. Um, so yeah, sorry, moving on with the, with the next slide. Um, one of the other so the final kind of organic network that I was interested at the time in, in looking at or I'd had a bit of experience with um, were um, these things called motor proteins. So on the right you're seeing a, an animation of um, a motor protein called a kinesin. Um, and what this does is that it walks, it literally walks, it's, it's got the other name of being a walking protein. 
um, organic cargo um, along these, um, uh, it's called the cytoskeleton of a, of a cell. So it's like all these um, um, networks, these roads um, that are um, connect different parts of the cell up. It walks organic cargo between um, different points in, in the cell, which just to me is absolutely mind blowing. Um, because when I think I imagine the cell, I imagine things just sort of flying around in this like soup. So to actually see something pulling in a kind of quite mechanical sense um, material from one point um, of the cell to another, um, yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I was just absolutely fascinated with it and wanted to know more. Um, and so origin eventually, I think moving on to the next slide, um, oh, well, one of the, the, the things as well that was interesting about it was that these things are, these motor proteins are, are working on a scale uh, called the nano scale. So you've got um, a microscopic scale, which is you'd need a microscope to sort of look at, and that would be sort of bacteria and things like that. But then the nano scale is like, we're talking about like atoms, we're talking about smaller than a wave of light. So the reason that a lot of um, these um, images or uh, computer animations exist as animations rather than showing you ha it happening in real time is because you can't actually point um, a microscope, you can't point an atomic force microscope or, 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 or have a visual hmm. look at it because it's smaller than a wave of light. Um, so you can't actually see what's happening. So what they use is um, this AM, AFM um, machine which is a bit like a record player with a stylus um, and that stylus has a point that passes over the atomic structure of things and then it builds a picture using a, um, a laser to measure the uh, uh, difference in height as it passes as the, that, that atom wide point moves over other um, atoms on a surface and I know this is something that um, I was talking to Henry about and he actually took me to a, a university where we were able to have a go um, with one, which was absolutely an incredible experience. Um, so yeah, um, just to sort of um, sort of go back to the the the, the walking protein, the Kinson protein. Um, sorry, you can stay on that uh, uh, other image. <laughs> um, knowing that this is how um, certain mechanical Chem, uh, processes happened within a cell that you they existed essentially along roads um, transporting cargo it was very evocative of the idea of um, thinking about um, a city with all its kind of motorways or vans and trucks and cars and, and, and trains and various different kinds of transportation moving um, cargo throughout a city in order to kind of you know keep an infrastructure um, and economy kind of keep that city um, thriving um, and so one of the um, so taking that analogy further from from um, that cell um, you could you could talk about a city as a cell and you could think about possibly um, what it might be like to imagine a city as a cell um, and within that regard the the kinesin proteins are like people or they're like trucks or, or whatever that are transporting things from one part of the city to another um, and the organelles which are the um, uh, basically if you imagine like a human body composed of, composed of organs uh, if you think of that in regards to a cell the organelles are the same sort of purpose they're kind of like the organs of the of the cell and so some of the organelles that you might sort of know quite readily are things like the nucleus which is like the core of the cell um, but there's lots of other organelles which you might be familiar with or, or not so much but um, you have things like the mitochondria which are the uh, they generate chemical energy within that cell um, and you have the Golgi apparatus which sort of sorts through proteins and, and organizes them and sends them out to where they need to go and so you can start to think about these things as analogies of places in that city as well so for instance if the nucleus is the core it could be like the, the, the town hall or the, the, the sort of library where like all the information is um, stored. 
the mitochondria which creates energy could be seen as like um, a power plant um, or a, 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 an energy grid. Um, and then the Golgi apparatus, for instance, if it's sorting proteins and sending that, could be seen as like a post office. So this is something that you could start to think about, a city as a cell and finding analogies um, between how you could look at a city and break it up into organelles um, and how you could have transport systems that are influenced by these organic networks that are set up within cells to, to take material to and, to and from different points. Um, <clears throat> so, as well, um, one of the things that you can look at with regards to taking things to different parts of the, of the city is um, how long it takes to, to get between one point and another. And so this um, graphic is actually called an isochrome. Um, and what it does is it gives you, it generates a, um, a map of how far you can go within a certain time frame. Um, so starting from the, the blue sort of dot in the, in the middle, um, you can extrapolate out how far you can go um, within 20 minutes by walking, which is the red line, and how far you can go within 20 minutes uh, on, a, on a bicycle, which is the blue line. And you actually generate, rather than just a, 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 an equal like circle, um, you get this more globular um, image because there's different routes that will be connected better and some that will have um, obstructions, which might be, might be buildings or you know, you might be able to go faster because it's a park and it's all flat land or it's a canal and it's flat, um, or it might be a really heavily urbanised area um, with lots of winding roads that take longer. And so again, just going on this analogy of this idea of a city as a cell, um, thinking about it within this more like biological um, shape. Sorry, Henry, we did mm. sort of go on, on to your... I'm going to shut up for a second and <laughs> Henry talk about his uh, work. <laughs> yes, um, I mean, this, this project it's kind of inspired from the, um, the the Silk Road and and then also the maritime part of it, which is called um the String of Pearls, and um this is the, the I think the current map in two thousand nineteen as as I was doing the project in Sri Lanka and then uh, at the at the folk, at at the at the backgrounds you can see this is the the light troll gas stations where um China has kind of um, settles in the Hambantota port in South Sri Lanka then um, I mean I was so kind of interested in how how this kind of the network of um, um, supply chain is being built in in this time in related to the the histories of the the Silk Road and then it's 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 also kind of remind me of like a slime mold where it's try to find the, the 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 most efficient route to gathering resources so and this is one of the piece and then this is the one of the performance that we um trying to invite people to to become part of the um supply chains <laughs> become a, um become part of the resources why when we using the um, different motif of of the seas uh, to in in maybe in inviting people and seducing people to join in return with the the pearls and then i also come to interested in, in pearls more and more that why they use the, the the string of pearls as kind of the symbols for the maritime's um strategic locations and then also try to i'm um, try to tracing back the the um, pearls diver during the colonial period and then also the the meanings of pearls in in china's in, and in other other cultures and then um this project was in 2019 i was collaborating with um, many scientist groups in thailand and also a, a space exploration initiative in mit media labs we are trying to send pearls uh, synthetic pearls to to international space station for a month I mean, um, this was inspired by the landing of the um, Chang uh, Four uh, lunar lander in two thousand early two thousand nineteen. I mean, I was trying to think about how how the Silk Road map was mapping out on Earth, and then what if it's 
going up to the space how it would look like and then how would the the network or the the mesh wire of this um, resources um, route would 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 be like and then and in this 2019 project we we try to um, turn people into um, an oyster producing pearl for for us yeah um so uh similarly at the, at the time sort of independently but still quite linked into the, the stuff that we were interested in that we were talking about um i um did a, um, a workshop online um which was about looking at those and trying to put into practice some of that idea of what it would look like to um, begin to create an artwork along these routes that could be um, evocative of um, um, sort of the, uh, the Silk Road on a, on a larger scale, but and then also kind of, but also trying it on a, a city scale as well to, to, to see what kind of barriers might come up or, or, or just trying to basically like put it into practice, see how it would work. And so one of the, the workshops that I led was, um, as I said, if you were thinking about Kinnison as people or the kind of cars or movement of, of, of um, uh, the, the, the analogy mm. um, being the kid, like them being the Kinnison, um, what would it be like if they acted like Kinnison or if they were, and because Kinnison are walking protein, there's already this kind of anthropomorphic um, idea that you can already sort of put to people that um, ask them to like walk like Kinnison proteins or to act or create a choreography um, that is um, reminiscent of what the these um, organelles within the cell might be like. And so on the <clears throat> on the left is was sort of like a few performative um, uh, tests I did with a with some performance performance artists to, to get them to try and walk like Kinnison um, proteins um, and on the right was a sort of concept drawing that I put out where I liked the idea of having a, a sort of giant balloon um, suspended above people that they're kind of carrying around in a suit that they're wearing and creating a, some Kinnison uh, globular feet for like shoes that they need to wear um, which um, I would have liked to have taken further, but um, this was during the um, uh, long lockdown um, that we experienced here in the, uh, the UK during the, the, the pandemic, um, and I lost all access to my studios and uh, even ability to go out and try this in, in places, which was um, the idea to, to try and get some choreography happening outside um, between different points in the city that we identify. So, if that was a high street um, somewhere in Birmingham that has a post office and a library, which could stand as analogies for like the Golgi apparatus and the, the, the nucleus, we could do some performances along those um, routes. Um, and I think the next slide, there's just a, a screenshot of, of us um, trying some choreography um, at our, in our homes, as I say, because we weren't able to meet up in person to, um, to do things. Um, but yeah. It's, it's an exciting project that I hope that we'll be able to pick up again um, and maybe we'll tie in more with, with um, mine and Henry's um, future collaboration as well, being able to do some things along some Silk Road um, routes. And um, the next one, I think this, this is the uh, Daphnir or, or water fleas, very, very tiny, tiny um, organism in, in the, we can find in most of the rivers, I, I believe. And um, there was in this this I mean this year in March I was collaborating with an, another choreographers and um, a fr a researchers who are researching on on this uh, Daphnia's lives and then we are trying to um, create also the choreograph of the the Daphnia and then mic or, or microorganism um, choreographies and then I mean the ideas came from. Uh, what if we already terraform the moon it's also about the moon again and how how would the these microorganisms would would um, celebrate in this um, primordial soup i mean the primordial soup is the the, the idea of the, the the soup where like billions of years ago on earth um 
like microorganism was emerged in in this kind of a chemical um, soup and then th that's where life emerged and then also uh, I was because this project was try to to think about um, the memories of the princess Kanguya who who was um, who was living on the moon then at the end of her life she become um, the origin of life on 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 the moon and then we try to um, find a way to to um, create a choreographies and then to celebrate and then of course we we create a choreographies a movement which is inspired from the like, small like organisms and oh, wait is it only two? Oh, okay uh, wait oh sorry <laughs> and then um after we tried the physical one and then we also try to 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 do the virtual one as well we because because uh, you can see that the 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 water flea was swimming in in three axes then when we were practicing we can only do two axes then we we were trying to um try to do three axis choreographies in in the vr yeah, because inside the VR we can swim up and down. And then in the 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 scene inside the VR is is the the scene of the moon, where it's already terraformed. Yes. So um, as I said, um, in sort of mid February, I was successfully able to to come over to um, Bangkok, which I'm very um, thankful for. It was absolutely incredible experience, um, which. Um, it's been made possible by British Council, um, and um, uh, some of the photos that follow are just some of the things that we sort of um, went to see, and Henry sort of showed me. Also, sort of early on, um, Henry took me to the um, temple, so I believe this is Wat Arun. Um, but we, uh, Henry also took me on a, a tour of Wat Pho and um, the Grand Palace, um, and it was interesting to see um, just how sort of um, big the, 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 the temple complexes were and, and sort of read about the history of it and um, sorry, sorry. Um, take part as um, well also read a bit about um, on the right there's, a, there's an image that sort of details the um, changes to the Buddha, the iconography um, over different eras um, and this led to lots of um, interesting conversations around going back and thinking about what it would mean in terms of like um, 3D printing or how generative sort of coding could could um, look at uh, having a sort of genetic algorithm or something could help sort of like evolve or change um, things over time or iteration and so you get new um, additions to something rather than having a copy at the same time it could um, be slightly um, augmented or different each time um, and then yeah the uh, the next image was <clears throat> I included because um, not being a an incredible, not being a particularly spiritual person myself. I mean, the UK is not <clears throat> enormously. I wouldn't say. Um, I think if you took a sort of demographic of of, of people's faith um, or, or beliefs, um, you would find that it's it's quite a largely secular um, kind of country. Although obviously deeply um, uh, with 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 uh, lots of different faiths, um, but historically a, <clears throat> a Christian. Um, country and um, one of the things that we did was uh, Henry gave me these Chinese fortune um, sticks um, and instructed me on how to, to sort of use them and, and um, I was um, asking to sort of make um, um, uh, not a wish exactly but think about <coughs> something that I wanted answers to <coughs> Excuse me. at the time I was uh, thinking about my father and certain things about sort of family and hoping he was okay and also not having been able to um, go and see him for a while um, and it was just very straight uh, not strange I suppose but um, kind of destined that um, the number that would come out of my fortune six was 13 which is when he was is, is his birthday and um, his lucky number um, <laughs> and uh, the card actually had stuff to do with um, um, the family as well and, and it was just a very it was it was truly a, a quite um, incredible deeply spiritual sort of feeling going around the different temples and, and having conversations with Henry about um, faith and um, uh, Buddhism and, um, and um, just the architectures and, and, and it was, uh, yeah, it was very moving and made a big impression on me. 
Um, and we went for, um, I think, the, the, the sort of following day, we went to uh, look around the city and um, we went to a talk in the evening. Um, Henry put me on a um, bicycle taxi, a motorbike, 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 motorcycle taxi. Motorcycle taxi, taxi yes. which is the first time I've ever been on a motorbike in my life, so that was quite an experience. Um, and yeah, we went to this talk about urban pollinators in Bangkok, which was because 2020 was the year of biodiversity, um, and so there was there was certain talks that were arranged on that, and it was really fascinating talk that kind of covered how um, by studying urban ecology, the 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 um, the the plants, the animals, the pollinators, the plant life, mm. um, by studying urban ecology, you can help shape um, urban planning, which is sort of what we've been talking about in previous interests and projects with how nature or natural processes are helping to shape um, or complement mm. um, how you humans can live more sort of harmoniously within cities. Um, and how it was quite interesting as well to hear some of the, the research that had come out to suggest that how cities are actually quite can be quite beneficial to a lot of um, animals, whereas we can normally think of it being the the opposite, um, because they can provide stable habitats, um, whereas nature um, can change rapidly or is being sort of destroyed by by humans um, and will probably get worse. And so we really need to, in, in one of the strands of being able to solve this um, environmental issue is is designing cities that work harmoniously with um, with the natural world and, and animals um, and plants in mind. Um, so I think following on, um, again, uh, one of the other days, we Henry took me to the Fab Cafe in Bangkok, which was absolutely brilliant because um, he knew that I'd been talking about 3D printing with clay and so um, he showed me that the Fab Cafe certain machines that they use and you can see the different kind of um, clay bodies that they've used, so some of those are porcelain and some of them are like terracotta and um, you Sim can, Sim dip, you know, the machine, the, the maker, maker box that they use, um, there, whereas I've sort of just like cobbled together my own sort of 3D printer which doesn't work <laughs> brilliantly all the time, so being able to sort of get some more experience of, of um, what, it, what is used um, across the world in terms of um, this emerging um, manufacturing process. Um, was really amazing because also just seeing some of the objects as and sorry you can yeah carry on to the next slide but, um, oh, sorry. this chair um and plant pots um were actually made to the same sort of fabrication process except using concrete rather than clay so thinking about different pastes and materials that can sort of go through um and thinking on sort of bigger scales um i was looking at um, an article recently about um, sort of first houses in Europe which have been 3D printed using um, concrete and I know I think this is something that probably China were already um, sort of decades ahead of, of everyone printing mansions and, and, and um, uh, housing out of um, these similar sort of processes but it's just started to sort of come over to Europe and people started looking at it in, in Holland um, yeah. and the UK. Um, and of course, the material library was, um, which is how the Fab Cafe was, was hugely um, inspirational as well for me for looking not only at the kinds of materials that you can um, work with, um, or which the Fab Cafe have, have used, but also cataloging that in a way that that shows where that can those materials can be found within the city. So if I wanted to work with a certain material. Um, how I can sort of approach sort of local manufacturers um, or, or keep things um, carbon, you know, offsetting sort of carbon footprints of, of, of things, um, you know, how you can source things locally to, to build with. Um, and I thought that was just a really incredible resource to have yes. in the city and something that I kind of want to try and set up in some maybe smaller way here in Birmingham. Yeah, that, um, that's what would be cool. Yeah. I mean, actually, this one has come from um, Thailand Creative and Design Centers. And then, um, okay. yeah, it's it's the the collections. Yeah, before before the Fab Fab Cafe was, um, kind of jo joining the same buildings. Yeah, but it's Thank kind you. of um, yeah. I was going to say Henry might have to jump in on these slides and correct me on certain things. <laughs> no, no <laughs> but problem. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, and yeah, going to exhibitions, so this was um, on the left most uh, image, there is a, a piece of work that was in Craft Museum that we went to, which uh, again is, I'm not, I don't know how it's been sort of made, but again, very inspirational for thinking about how with 3D printing, there's this idea that it's very kind of neat and orderly and it's a, it's a computer that's, you know, plotting it. Um, but actually what happens maybe if you introduce more of a human element or an organic sort of element again, um, and create things that have um, structure um, but aren't as neat, they're a bit more sort of messy, and, and actually that being probably more um, beneficial to, um, if you were going to think about creating something for um, insects to use or plants to sort of work into, um, they might find forms like this more, more useful, more organic sort of forms um, than, than straight up sort of cylinders that are, that are printed or um, really geometric things that are printed by uh, the computer. And Henry also introduced me to um, Mr. Todo, um, oh, who showed me some of his work. So he's a professor of um, architecture at um, university. Julian Kong University's international program in design architecture. Thank you. Yeah. And um, he had been um, working with 3D printing clay. And so some of these, uh, this image in the middle is um, a plate that he made using 3D printing, but he actually, rather than 3D, so he has worked with 3D printing clay into ceramics um, directly, but this was also um, um, looking at other ways, which I hadn't considered, of 3D printing formers that you then um, can press clay into or, or pour um, slip into to create slip molds and, and things like that. And that was just something I hadn't really thought about doing as well, rather than uh, turning it on its head um, that way, um, but still involving sort of 3D printing. Um, because there are limitations to 3D printing clay that, that exist that, that plastic sort of is superior in, in doing, which sounds really, I mean, ideally you wouldn't be working in plastic, you'd be working in clay, but you can print things in maybe plaster, um, like my early work, which so, so realizing that, that I could 3D th print things in plaster and then pour clay into those or um, press more clay into them was just something that I hadn't thought about, even though it sounds quite obvious. <laughs> mm. It was really great to see some examples of that. Um, and then I think one of the uh, last sort of images was just again, the kind of being able to go around the city and see the architecture and Henry giving me sort of the history of, of some of the buildings and the architecture, but just, uh, I mean, the building on the left, uh, the uh, Naha Nakon yes, Nakon building skyscraper. Yes. Um, again, going back to this idea of the kind of generative um, architecture and and how you could look at how organic um, mutations or um, um, perm, um, iterations on on um, a three D model could be sort of introduced to to give you these kind of more glitched um, sort of models or or ideas about what architecture or um, 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 urban sort of buildings could look like, um, and in the middle of the um, tower, the Sakon yeah, yes. um, tower. Um, so the, the sort of history of the building aside, there was just something about the way that it was made up in these curved um, kind of buttresses and, and, and the form of it um, was just really interesting as well from a, um, a design standpoint and thinking about, um, you know, seeing how pollution as well sort of um, sort of falls on the building, or, or um, thinking about designs in a way that could sort of mitigate that, or um, think about how wind is channeled through um, city centres um, so that it's it's beneficial to um, life, um, other life other than humans. Um, so sort of not just thinking about what's good for humans, but thinking about what's good for um, animals, insects, plants, um, and maybe even like bacteria and things. So thinking about what could be introduced to uh, make cities more um, um, sort of uh, can, uh, anti, you, you could introduce things that are sort of antibacterial mm. um, without using chemicals. So you could look at nano processes um, for how, how you could create surfaces that create um, antimicrobial textures um, without having to sort of use chemicals or, 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 or things like that. Um, and then finally, just of personal interest, this was a, a part of the sort of spiritual kind of experience that I was having um, on our sort of tour of the temples. This was a, a Catholic church that we came across, and I was, I was brought up um, uh, in a sort of Catholic, um, from a Catholic background, so it was just really interesting to see um, 
this um, architectural. Um, I mean, even the, the so this was like the the, the spout at the bottom of it for, for rainfall having this um, crocodile on it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just really interesting to me in terms of taking something that I've known growing up in terms of what a Catholic sort of church looks like, but then that existing in, in Thailand and, and the architecture being responsive to to place obviously and, and seeing how different things um, evolve out or are, are styled in different places. Sorry, wait. Yeah, and I'm going to hand it over to Henry to talk about some more of our um, oh, yes. um, yeah, things that we do. I also took um, lorries to visit um, several places more. Like this one is Freak Labs. Um, yeah, this is uh, futuristics and research in enigmatic and uh, knowledge. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and enigmatic and aesthetic knowledge. Yeah, it's uh, based at the uh, Kim Mungkut Institute of Technologies, and then um, this is Professor Virasak, and he was talking about the, um, like the, the uh, scientist projects, which is also a kind of um, they try to create um, uh, a, a, um, a map of the spiciness of Tom Yam Kung across uh, Bangkok where they they will use the sensors to to detect how 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 spicy it is um in in the um, scoville unit yeah and then i mean th- there's can be very fun projects that came out from from t- scientists as well yeah and then i also took um lorries to visit uh, a friend who also um a ceramist then also um yes this is thai thai, thai chinese food where we I'm not sure if Laurie is familiar with this taste, but of course, um, it's also um, first time for Laurie to try the durians, which I have to finish the, the, them all, yeah, the, and then also um, the the mosquito bite that look very scary for for Laurie's. I mean, I mean, it's kind of interesting to. This is uh we 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 took a boat along the Chapria rivers to visit different locations and then um, um yeah we took lorries to see the exhibition at uh, BACC or Bangkok Art and Culture Center this is the the uh, photo exhibition of the princess of course we have a a talk from from lorries so oh, yeah, yeah i what well, i was um there, I, uh, in Bangkok, I thought some of the things that I've been looking at with most proteins um, and uh, the, the map of Birmingham and, and forming along the um, some different parts of the city, how that might look if we... Um, so we did a workshop where we, we emulated that um, in uh, using Bangkok. Um, and so um, I won't sort of go through the whole yeah. workshop, but just to give some idea of what happened, we I would give... Um, the participants, um, uh, uh, the organelles, the different organelles, which were listed on the on the previous slide, um, and then asked them, and then and then showed them a description of what that organelle did. Um, so I've already given you some examples, like the mitochondria is like it creates energy within the cell, so it could be like a power plant, um, and the nucleus is is like the center of the you know where so all the decisions are made so it could be like the the town hall or it could be the the, the library or, or something like that where information is stored um but what i was interested as well is in is not just this really direct analogy of those um things by this point i was aware that you could make those direct analogies of saying like well this is like the post office or this is like um you know whatever based on its description but actually I was starting to get interested in a more personal idea of what people might think. So if we took the cell membrane, for example, if we took it as controls entry and exit to the cell, you could, uh, in a scientific book, it might say, well, that's the city limits. You know, that's the peripheral sort of edge of the city. But actually, what, it, what would it be like if you were asking someone to talk about that from a more personal sort of um, point of view? So could the, the, the cell membrane be um, uh, how, how you know I think on some of the other slides I give some examples um, that it could be um, I can't oh, remember off the top of my head oh uh, yeah so the 
to someone they might say that the, the, the cell membrane is the, the airport or it's the, 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 the river. Um, you know, their, their um, membrane might be around their neighbourhood hmm. or it might be uh, a much more local sort of thing rather than thinking about it sort of in, in a city-wide um, aspect. And also if you were going to talk about things like the mitochondria being, they create power, so it's like a power plant, but you could argue that someone might say that um, it could be somewhere that gives them energy, it could be like their favourite coffee shop or um, a music uh, a concert hall or um, theatre space um, that actually is what gives them energy. And so it, it could take on a much more sort of personal um, analogy for, for people to, to work in a more local sort of sense. Um, rather than as, uh, as big as a city-wide or globally as like a Silk Road um, scale. Um, so, one of the things that was kind of interested during this time that we were kind of, it was dawning on us that Henry wasn't probably going to be able to come over to the UK because things were just getting worse here by the day um, and are still pretty bad, <laughs> even if Henry had come over. Everything was sort of locked down, so there wouldn't have been anything to do. Um, I started just looking at some quite sort of um, some basic sort of data around like connections mm. uh, between Birmingham and Bangkok and um, putting it into Google Maps, um, <laughs> just seeing like how long it would sort of take to walk. Um, it comes out at 2,356 hours, which is approximately kind of 98 days. Uh, but it was interesting the thought that you could walk it. I mean, it's pretty much connected all the way apart from when you get to the UK, you have to take a ferry over. Um, but just that idea of walking along sort of a landmass like that. And then also getting an idea of the topography. So on the left, you can see oh, the elevation. Uh, oh, and you see that there are some actually like big spikes in there. And then if you go and investigate those spikes, you find um, uh, that the sort of tallest one is in Uzbekistan and, and the, the sort of second one is, is in <laughs> India. Um, and you start to get an idea of like the mm. the um, topography. the texture mm. of the of the planet. Sorry, were you going to say something? Then? So topography, right? Yeah, to, yeah. The the, the how the, the, the elevation mm, how it yeah. sort of gets um, you know the mountainous kind of areas. Mm. Um, and then when we were thinking about how, oh, so on the next slide, I was sort of remembering um, a talk that I'd been to. Um, at a, a conference in London some years ago where um, this device on the bottom left, this um, organ on a chip was presented. Mm. Um, and this has become something that um, is being sort of uh, used to, to, to test. Um, I mean, it's, as I said, it's an organ on a chip, so it's like a microchip, mm. but it can um, replicate some of the processes mm. of what it might be like for a culture to grow in an organ mm. uh, in the body rather than on a petri dish and the benefits of this are that um, in a petri dish you're essentially putting a culture into uh, a stagnant environment um, it's it's got a lid it's got like a food source in there um, and it's just you know it's not a true representation of what that slime mold would do if it was growing in the wild because mm. there'd be lots of other variables like textures on the surface of the, 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 the forest floor or there'd be wind or water or other things and that's what this, this, this chip sort of does so it creates a flow of nutrients rather than um, it just being rather than a culture being sat in a petri dish you put it in this chip and there's a flow of nutrients that goes through so you get a more accurate idea of what it's like in an organ an organ has is, is working and, and there's a natural sort of flow of things going through it but it also is squidgy um, and you can mechanically um, um, squeeze it so that it creates um, an environment that is also similar to being like an organ in a body with a heartbeat and, and things sort of moving and they found that you get a much more realistic reading from the cultures that are grown out of these um, organic organ chips than cultures that are just grown in petri dishes. And so if you apply that, or if you think about that within our slime mold, growing in this flat petri dish with no texture or wind resistance or movement or anything like that, and if you thought about, well, what if you grew it in not a flat 
mm. petri dish? What if you grew it in a textured petri dish? Mm. And what if that texture was a city? Well, what might that look like? So rather than with my Birmingham art map saying from getting from this point, which is one gallery, to this point, which is another gallery, it's not just a, a straight shot like that. There's actually lots of winding sort of um, roads or there's um, elevations in the in the land that mean it have to go sort of up uphill or downhill or things like that. And so what might it look like if we started to... Um, one of the ideas that we've been talking about is, is looking at introducing slime moulds into these textured environments that could be representational of a city, but could also be representational of that kind of elevation between globally Birmingham and, and Bangkok. Um, and so as well, going back to thinking about some of the early sort of experiments that I was doing when me and Henry met in, in Tokyo, where we were experimenting with blue light, what if we also, as well as textures, put in materials mm. which are representative of um, places along the Silk Road? Um, so you could have saffron or pearl, crushed up pearl or cloves or lapis luzzi, um, and create a material map of of the uh, material map and elevation of the Silk Road within a petri dish, you'd probably by that point have to work on a much bigger scale. It might be more like a big sort of table or plate. And how would slime mould move through that and and sort of see whether we could um, find or um, see kind of interesting mm -hmm. parallels within the old kind of um, Silk Road, but also with the sort of 21st Silk Road, uh, 21st century Silk Road. Um, and also the maritime Silk Road. And something that also sort of sparked that idea was the recent kind of news of the blockage in the Suez Canal. Mm. Um, and you can actually see within the maritime um, Silk Road, it passes through that Suez Canal near Egypt um, um, to get to Europe. Um, and so could we find like alternative routes um, that would mean that we don't have to go through the Suez Canal? Now, I know that's super ambitious and, and mm. Like I'm sure other people have examined that because that would be like a billion, trillion pound sort of answer. But it's just interesting. You don't know what you're trying. Yeah, and I mean, in Thailand, we, we tried to... to um, there was a proposal to, to dig this canal, which is shortened the distance from here to here, but of course there's still um, many uh, debate about um, environmental f um, effect or political... Um, blockage <laughs> yes but yeah. of course we could try it and then yeah we we plan to try to simulate this as we uh, as we could not meet in person or once we able to meet in person we we hope to try to to make it yes and then and next we we were um discussing about how how can we find a slime mold in 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 thailand or in bangkok and in birmingham and then we, we set out um, the same day to to go hunt for slime mold in in our local parts of forest and then um, maybe Laurie can explain a little bit about it mostly so just briefly we sort of identified different places that we could um, potentially go and find our own slime mold so the slime mold that I'd worked with in the past had been purchased through a laboratory in America um, and but I was aware through lots of research that it should be you should be able to find it like mm. places everywhere it seems like it was almost everywhere but as henry showed you on that life cycle um you don't initially you you do sometimes see what is called like the fruiting bodies um which is the yellow sort of tendrils that you um can observe with the eye but really the slime mold exists as well as these tiny tiny spores mm. that you can't can't see with your eyes so um the, in with regards to collecting slime molds if you find it um, in its fruiting body form, um, you're in luck. Like you can just take a sample from it. Um, but uh, if you can't find it, then you have to collect samples of sort of rotting leaves or bark and put them into these damp chambers, which is basically just a box with some wet tissue in it. And over time, see if that contains spores and you can kind of coax out some of these spores to kind of turn into fruiting bodies and then find your slime moth. Um, so the place that I went to in Birmingham was a place called Mosley Bog, 
um, which is actually quite famous for being the inspiration, if there's any Lord of the Rings fans, um, for being the, the inspiration behind, um, I think it's Mirkwood, or, or it's, the, it's, the, it's the ancient forest with the Ents in, the talking trees, and Tolkien lived nearby. Um, and so I chose this as my sort of place to go and try and find it. Um, didn't really have much success. <laughs> I mean, our odds were already quite low, but um, here you can see me taking some, uh, picking up some samples of some rotting um, vegetation and putting it into my damp chamber, um, which is just a box with wet kitchen towel in it, like I say. Um, and so, yeah, we didn't find it in slime mold, but it was also a chance to participate in, in like an urban ecology survey as well. So we were taking pictures of mushrooms and other sort of um, life that we, we encountered that was in, of interest and using an app called iNaturalist to log those um, findings, which takes part in this um, so it's between, I think it's it developed by National Geographic and um, a university in, in America. Um, and you can see it here that um, you take your picture, you upload it to the app, and then um, it will tell you what species you have found um, um, and is used to help scientists in, in, in knowing what species are around in an area. Yeah, I, I mean, this is my photos that I took. And then I, I went into some... Um, National and Ecology Wildlife Studies area in Chonburi in in like a two one and a half hour drive from Bangkok. I mean, I haven't got a chance to survey around different parks in Bangkok yet. And then I, the, the place I live, there was no no forest, I mean, like the, like the real forest. So um, I'm I'm set a plan to 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 visit different places, but um, of of course I I never. Um, see the real slime mold before, and then um, uh, and then also like what Laurie says, the potential that we might actually find a real slime mold or, or the spore, it's 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 very low. Then, but, but, but somehow we we tried. Yes, this is the area that I I'm I went to, and then this is the um, the area around the waterfall, which was closed um, because of the COVID. So I was I tried to sneak around a little bit as as far as I can. I mean. I, I mean, the, the, the iNaturalist app is really good, but sometimes it could not identify things that it's... Um, so I have no idea what it is. But of course, um, sometimes it's also um, really useful. I mean, when identifying animals, because of... The, not sure... Because I'm not sure how... What it is. So I'm, there, there would be some suggestions what potentially those discovery could be. But I, I still have no idea how to uh, really identify it. Yeah. And this is some of the footage that I I took while I try to looking for potentially slime mold or slime mold spore. I mean, um, I couldn't find a place. I mean, the waterfall area possibly be the have the condition that slime mold could grow maybe with, with enough humidities and not too hot weathers <laughs> and then <laughs> yes this is the last slide yeah so i think we, we we embarked on it knowing that it probably wasn't going to yield much but um as a, an activity that we could do at the same time remotely, it, it was um, just a fun opportunity to sort of be able to go out and try and find our own. Um, ultimately, I think we'll be probably buying some. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually ordered some from from eBay already, and then yeah, hopefully it arrives soon and then can start experiment, play with it. Yes. So thank you. Um, I know that was a lot of kind of information, mm -hmm. but. Um, if anyone had any questions about any of the things that we mentioned, um, we're really happy to, to, to answer those over the next sort of 15 minutes or half an hour or, or whatever.
I'm aware we haven't got too many people here, but if you also don't feel like asking any questions in person, then you could um, put them in the chat. Happy P the arm or a journalist, do you have any questions or any any just sharing feedback? Thank you, Henry. Um, yeah. For me, it's quite interesting for such uh, analogy. What of you try to try to make it? In fact, I have learned some other things uh, from another side that there. I, I could I can give one example that I just heard from Stanford. There is one uh, PhD student in Faculty of Engineering. She tried to do something with the AI and try not not really. I would love to say the robot. In fact, she tried to make uh, the robot move like human, but the way she she had she has to construct it. It's not so easy because you know the way the robot move is so how to say it's very it's not flexible like human being. Mm -hmm. So the way she did, she tried to study about the dancing, choreography, and so on, and try to understand all these things related to physiology of the human body. Then she make it uh, a kind of knowledge to transfer to to robot. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I I can say it's, a, it's like analogy somehow, right? <laughs> More or less the same as uh, you try to 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 compare or to make analogy between um, between cells between a uh, slum mall and uh, what's going on. Uh, in the city, but the case of city and cell, I'm still a bit, frankly um, speaking, I have to say that I'm I'm not, I I don't really agree of that. Uh, may I share some of my opinion in this case? Sure, absolutely, mm -hmm. please do. Yeah, because. Uh, you may know that you, you mentioned about uh, Suvarnabhumi Airport and uh, Jabhia River. Yes. Is a uh, look like a cell membrane, right? Yes. For uh, for Bangkok, but in fact, I have to tell you that uh, in the former time, uh, the border of Bangkok is uh, we use Jabhia River. Uh, as a border to the southern part, mm. but now Bangkok has been long time expand to the southern part of Bangkok. As you cross the river to uh, Wat Arun, mm. you see Wat Arun now it turns to, yeah it turns to be Bangkok already. It's not another city as before. This one thing. No, but absolutely, uh -huh. and um. But what's interesting with the with the cell membrane is that it's uh, it's something that pa things pass through, so it's permeable. Um, so ah. this idea that um, uh, yeah, it doesn't form a hard border oh, yeah. that um, means that it's like a wall, um, but that 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 people sort of move move across. Um, ah. But I, I really um, appreciate your yeah you, you you saying that because it's important as well. Because it's very there's a there's a lot of political mm. things to talk about within mm. borders mm. and and um, and looking at cities in this sort of way that's very um, you have to be sort of acknowledge um, uh, that those histories definitely. Yeah. And one more thing, uh, in the former time, all government place all those important place still in the middle part of Bangkok. Mm. But as you may know that now many, many government places uh, has been moved 
to the northern side of Bangkok. Mm. You know, this is mm. the thing is is maybe related to the city planning mm. or something change according to the traffic mm. or whatever. So it's always move. But if we look at the city planning, let's say in Europe, you always have a kind of uh, inner city, right? Mm. Let's say in London, in Vienna, or whatever, you, you always say something, uh, let's like say, in a circle inside, and then it expands. But in, for, for Bangkok, it's some other thing. <laughs> it, uh, there's, I have to say that it seems to me there's no city planning in the former town. It just happened by mm. the way the people settled. Mm. Yeah, and that's beautiful. That's that real kind of organic... Um, way that cities kind of um, are built up and I think yes yeah, city planning is quite a relatively new sort of concept in terms of human his time of human history where cities have grown to a point where considerations need to be made but in that initial output they are very much like that sort of organic um, yes. like you say yes. how they spring up um, and that's fascinating as well because you get history, layers of history um, from that, from where sort of um, buildings have shifted or things that have been built on top of um, um, old kind of um, um, historical um, parts of the city. I I love the way you use the word organic. I I, I agree, I agree, because it seems to me it's kind of simultaneous, right? Mm, Yes. It, it just happened uh, naturally. Yeah. But now, yeah. uh, when people, how to say, we, we use more machine, more knowledge, more scientific, and so on, I don't know, it turns to be, it can be more complicated, or even more dangerous, or can be fruitful in many aspects. Mm. Let's say for the, for the pandemic, one might say that because of the problem of the too many man-made things, right? Mm. Absolutely, yeah. So I completely agree with you. And it also means that when you are, when you have a committee who's in charge of or responsible for this planning, um, that's not necessarily in the best interest of everybody in that city. It, it will normally benefit um, the more wealthy or um, uh, will will have priority in certain areas mm. where things will be developed or uh, made better uh, whereas the slime mold is 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 making yeah. everything better equitably for itself to be able to move things around city planning means that um, only certain areas will be uh, yeah developed and others will be sort of um, forgotten about or the more um, undesirable things that need to be put up in the city, like power plants or whatever, will be moved to um, the certain areas of the city, which will impact. In Birmingham, depending on where you live in the city, um, there, you, there is a, a difference of 10 years life expectancy um, based on which areas are uh, more clean air or which areas are more polluted. Um, so it's, it's a very un, unequal um, thing once you start to involve this idea of city planning by humans uh, rather than letting things grow uh, organically. I come up with one idea by the time that you share your experience or you share your opinion right now. Uh, we should think that how the cell, how the human being still survive until now and if we love to let our lives peacefully or still, how to say, live in the, how to say, peacefully way or healthy way, we should be, how to say, we should learn mm. from the nature, from the cell and so on. Instead of just thinking, uh, let's say, make something, let the people try to make something, how to say, horrible, like we see the scientific uh, fiction then mm. we may survive and we won't face the problem as we face it right now. 
That's the point I, I could get from you try to say about the, all this analogy. And this supposed to be fruitful if we can put this as the philosophy of all how mm. we can work. Mm. Yes. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much, Thomas. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yes, I mean we were discussing a lot about the um, swamp um, intelligence, like how how animals kind of work collectively as as one, like um, like or slime moles, ants or bees. I mean, how can we? I mean, when I was studying about the the neuroscience that we we are centralizing our our knowledge into one places, but why different organism or animals they 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 kind of decentralize. Um, their their resources to different parts of different bodies and then maybe in case one was um damages then the rest still carry on then live and grows yeah. and then yeah of course the slime as a, a one single body which is very fascinating for us how how it can um how it can think create and find resources efficiently why the our hum, human civilization st- uh, needs yeah, <laughs> so much time to to find yeah. out yeah definitely I mean, I mean yeah slime mold doesn't have a brain but it exhibits an intelligence um and uh, one of the the things actually when you were mentioning bees and, and hive minds one of the notes that i made from that bio uh, from that poll- urban pollinators talk was um, that I found really interesting was it said that bees will when they're moving um, to a new nest um, the bees vote um, in the colony and they need at least 70% um, oh, yes. to go ahead with something and it's just interesting to think that how did that arise because bees have been around for millions and millions of years mm. um, and they will have evolved for that to be the case, that for some reason set for, for over generations and generations, that 70% of a colony agreeing on something is the right amount to go ahead with it. And you can imagine that if it's almost more than that or less than that, it's met with disaster. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it's just interesting how nature finds these levels. Um, and, and we'd be foolish not to, to, to use them or listen to them as metrics. Um, when when thinking about making our own um, cities, I think that probably wraps up. Unless anyone's got any other questions, but I mean, you can feel free to um, email us or um, put something in the chat I think afterwards, I'm, or contact Henry. Or I think Om um, <laughs> um, Jim want to say something. Yeah, of course. Hi, Om Yim. I cannot hear you, Kap. We can't hear you. You can type. All right, then, then, um, Okay, then uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us today and then, um, Laurie and I will continue developing these projects further and then also thank you um, British Council for supporting these projects and um, there's, uh, there are many more projects that also connected to this Connecting to Culture, culture Grants um, also a pr- project by Janalis, project by 141 and then project by Kamon Nath that also talk about bio design and then fashions and then also projects about um, puppetries between um, Bangkok, uh, Thailand and UK as well. I'm very used to this. Ah, okay, the, there was a message from Om Yim. Yeah. Thank you very much Om Yim. And thank you for Alice and everyone um, who's joined today. Um, and thank you Henry um, for collaborating um, on, on this project. Uh, with me, it's been endlessly fascinating and interesting. And thank you, as well, British Council, for uh, allowing it to happen uh, and funding us. Um, and have a pleasant rest of the day, everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, see you again soon.
see you again. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a so lot.